Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues in languages, good evening and thank you for your interest in my today's presentation. My today's topic is the chief findings of audio linguistics. So we might all be wondering what this is and what audio linguistics is about. So I better begin my presentation by defining what I'm going to talk about. So by audio linguistics, a term I use today as an umbrella term to cover data from different disciplines related to both sound and language. Uh, more technically, I understand uh, audio linguistics to be a branch of uh, psychophysiolinguistics. Psychophysiolinguistics is actually a well, non-existent, not yet existent discipline which should combine information on how language operates, functions, works, is assimilated, and so on, both on the physiological, biological uh, level and on the psychological level. So to, by now, there are different disciplines more oriented at the psychological aspects of language functions and at the biology of it, say, physiology of speech. So here in the second point, you see uh, the names of several disciplines which already exist, which deal with both language and sound somehow. So phonetics is well known, well established. Phonetics studies the sounds of the language, so from more or less, so to, to say, it, uh, physical points of view. So what their features are, what their differences are, and so on. Now phonology also has existed for a century. Now it deals with the psyche, with the more psychological, uh, lay, say, aspects of uh, sounds, that is the sounds that our mind perceives and analyzes, so sounds as units of language. So this is well established in linguistics uh, too. Well, psychoacoustics uh, deals with sounds as uh, stimuli that provoke certain reactions in the physiology and in the psychology of, of a person. So psychological, physiological responses to uh, sounds as external uh, stimuli. So how do we uh, physically and psychologically uh, react if we hear this kind of sound, this, the sound of this uh, volume, this intensity, and so on. So this is psychoacoustics. This is also well, known. Uh, speech physiology studies how uh, different biological uh, organs uh, work producing uh, speech or perceiving speech when we hear it. So this is separate uh, disciplines, and they all offer s different insights into this process. Although the process, we understand, is, is one thing. So when we speak, any moment we speak, or any moment we hear and understand speech, something is happening, a very complex mechanism uh, is working in milliseconds, uh, producing the, the result that we understand what we hear, or we manage to put across our message, we manage to express by ways of sound waves, what we wanted to say, what we conceived in our mind. Now, going back to audio linguistics, so why do we need, or why did I decide to sort of invent a special term to combine data from different disciplines? That is actually, uh, namely, to integrate uh, information that we already have, but which remains sort of fragmentary. So it, uh, there are some clinical medical aspects related to speech pathology and speech therapy, which provides important insights on in how language and speech works or what can uh, impede the normal functioning of, of speech, of language use. But this is rarely connected with the data of linguistics, so this is rarely considered by linguists in general, so it remains in the medical sphere. And in a similar way, uh, acoustic aspects of the study of speech, which acoustics being part of physics basically, just measuring uh, the intensity of sounds and their other qualities, this is not always related to uh, the actual use of speech, the functioning of the language system, which is something that linguistics uh, deals with. Well, psycholinguistics is probably the discipline that comes closest to integrating data from various disciplines. Psycholinguistics, to put it simple, being the study of the process of speech, speech production, speech perception, in all its complexity. So psycholinguistics is probably the closest uh, interdisciplinary uh, field of research which provides important insights into the nature of, uh, of speech and how we use, how we perceive, how we produce 
uh, speech. So to put it all together, to combine data from several sources, I invent this uh, term audio linguistics for us to refer to it as one uh, complex of information. Now more particularly, audio linguistics, if we use this term now, uh, studies the connections between hearing, speech production, brain functions, and the system of language. So these four different elements, which are intrinsic to the, to the process of speaking, to understanding language, so they all play a tremendously important role uh, in, in this simple everyday act that we are so accustomed to uh, performing uh, day after day. And obviously, it seems to me quite uh, obvious that understanding the processes operating here can provide us with very interesting and important insights into the underlying mechanisms of uh, language learning. Because when we are born into this world, we somehow manage to acquire our mother tongue in a few uh, years. So, and we started speaking in the second year, uh, more or less. So very fast, we manage to subconsciously, somehow unconsciously, uh, process and integrate very complex issues that later as adults, as linguists, we have much trouble understanding and describing scientifically. So this is why I decided to share this information with you today. So a lot of this information is still uh, in the process of uh, well, verification, let's put it so, and the interpretation of many facts depends on the empirical perspective that any uh, particular person can take. So it would be interesting to have your feedback and see how this corresponds with uh, your experience learning and using languages. Now, more, more precisely, more particularly, I'm going to base my today's presentation on several ideas by Alfredo Matisse, a French uh, otolaryngologist, uh, ear, nose and throat uh, doctor, uh, who actually started with uh, clinical practice, treating throats and hearing diseases, but later, after accumulating uh, research data, he came up with broader perspectives on hearing, uh, by itself and on hearing as connected with other vital functions such as speech, uh, our ability to, uh, res to be educated, to learn new things, and so on. Uh, so a few words uh, about him. Uh, he started off uh, treat as, as, a, as a doctor treating uh, opera singers and uh, uh, workers or, or factories and, the, and different uh, well, institutions, the field of aviation, uh, aeron aeronautics, he describes this in this way. So professional deafness and professional hearing loss. So uh, singers would uh, address him uh, when they had uh, troubles uh, with uh, getting the right uh, notes with the right pitch. So there was even, even quite a famous uh, singer who co contacted him with this uh, problem that he realized he couldn't get the right notes while, while he was singing. Although he was a perfectly trained, experienced opera singer, this was ruining his, uh, his pr professional life, basically. So he couldn't understand what was wrong with this, so he contacted Tomatis as a, as a throat doctor, and Tomatis realized there was uh, nothing wrong with his throat. After inspecting it, examining it thoroughly, he said that there's nothing wrong with it. So he started thinking what could the other reason for this be. And he came up with the only conclusion he could make in the situation that it was hearing that must have been responsible for this uh, problem with getting the right uh, pitch in musical notes. So this brought him to the understanding of the audio-vocal loop, so this bi biological connection between hearing and, uh, and phonation, sound production. Uh, that phonation, producing sounds, producing the right sounds, when we perceive them as right, as the ones we wanted to produce, with the right intensity, with the right volume, with the right pitch, etc., it's totally dependent on, on hearing, on hearing those sounds clearly and uh, distinctly. So I'll explain this in a little more detail afterwards. Now later on, he, uh, after continuing his research, this was his ma first kind of main major uh, discovery, which was confirmed by subsequent research, uh, he came up with broader uh, ideas, broader applications on various techniques uh, related to the treatments of 
hearing in connection with other uh, functions such as education, other fields of therapy, uh, treating various diseases not directly related to throats or, uh, or the ears. Uh, which some of his statements there still remain debatable. There's a lot of discussion in, in the academic uh, world about this, but this is definitely not something which is not uh, grounded on, on anything. So today, what, I'm, uh, what, what I'd like to do with your help uh, today is to present some of the statements by Tomatis related to language, so a lot of what he wrote uh, related to other fields of human life and uh, health and activity, but we are all here interested in languages in the first place. I'm going to name a few, so basic, basically three main statements by Tomatis related to language in connection with hearing, and I will contrast this uh, with data from other sources. So I'll present to you Tomatis's idea, what he actually stated, what he claimed was uh, happening there in the field of hearing and language, and I'll sh show you what other research disciplines uh, tell us about this. And we'll see if Tomatis's uh, ideas get confirmed or not get confirmed. Now, the first thing would be Tomatis's uh, audio-linguistic laws, the Tomatis laws or the audio-linguistic laws, he calls, this, uh, he calls them this way, and this is actually where he borrowed the, this word, uh, audio-linguistics, although he uses it as an adjective referring to his laws. So he, these laws are his formulations of the tendencies that he observed in the field of uh, hearing and phonation, so how they are connected in particular when we uh, speak about language. So the first law states that the voice only contains the frequencies that the ear can hear. So basically, in simple terms, it means that we cannot possibly pronounce anything with our, th with our throat, with our articulatory organs, uh, unless our ears are capable of hearing this uh, clearly and are capable of distinguishing these sounds, the sounds of this pitch, this intensity, and so on, in the uh, flow of sounds that, uh, that our ears perceive. So we cannot actually produce a certain sound uh, unless our ears are already capable of distinguishing it. Why this is so, I can uh, also explain a little later, speaking of his other ideas. Now, the second uh, law states that if the ear, so if, uh, say, the ear which has some problems, uh, gets access, hears missing frequencies. So if we, if we observe that uh, someone's ear, someone's hearing uh, is deficient in certain fre frequency zones, so a person cannot perceive sounds of certain pre pre uh, frequency due to well, hearing loss or other reasons, uh, it says that if we expose him to the missing sounds, the missing frequencies, these will be instantly and unconsciously restored in the vocal emission, so in the, in the, in the voice, in the production of sound. And finally, the third law states that auditory, auditory stimulation continued for a sufficient time can uh, affect and change phonation, production of sounds, uh, on a long-term basis. So by simply influencing a person's uh, hearing, providing uh, listening inputs uh, with certain types of sounds, certain frequencies, we can change the way how this person will actually be producing sound, will be speaking himself. Now what do the so other sources say about this? Uh, now we definitely know that the ear and the capacity of hearing are developed before birth. Uh, so long before we're born into this world, in our mother's womb, we already have ears, and these ears are functioning, so they can already perceive the sounds coming from, from the outside. And this is actually also important in the field of first language acquisition, because it doesn't start when we're born, but actually even before this, especially with the tonal, intonation, prosodic aspects of, uh, of the language. Also, we can definitely observe and state that uh, we listen before we learn to speak, read, and write in first language acquisition. So before we're able to, to say our first words, it, we can, it's actually proven, uh, we can demonstrate that a child understands a lot already, can understand uh, linguistic signals in the forms of, of phrases or, or words addressed uh, to him 
before he is actually capable of uh, saying those words uh, himself. This is particularly demonstrated by the so-called fist phenomenon. Uh, I'm probably not going to describe it uh, in detail now, but there was an experiment. Uh, a boy was shown a picture of a fish, and he could not uh, uh, say the word fish, he would always, always say fist, but if an adult would point at this picture and say, well, is it a fist? He would say, no, it's a fist. So this basically means that he can hear the distinction between S between S and SH sounds, although he is not capable of producing the SH sound himself. So this is uh, well known. There are many examples of this uh, sort from uh, different languages. So we know this uh, for sure. And we definitely sp hear and speak before we're able to read and write, so sometime before we go to school. So, and our oral comprehension is definitely the basis of a written speech. Written speech is secondary to, to oral speech. Now, this third point is the reason explaining actually the, the three laws by Tomatius. And you can see that they all basically mean the same thing, just marking different aspects of it. That Actually, it's the ear that controls the voice. It's the ear, the hearing, that has almost absolute control over vocal uh, emission, over the production of sounds. Now, when we speak, uh, when we produce uh, speech, when we say any kind of phrase, uh, how our brain understands that this is the right thing, that what he, it, our brain wanted to, uh, to produce to say is by means of auditory control. So we are the first ones to hear what we ourselves say. It takes milliseconds and uh, brain immediately uh, perceives what we ourselves produce in terms of sounds, both from the external uh, environment as uh, waves, uh, through the medium of uh, the air and through the tissues and bones of our own heads. So the sound goes directly into the, well, uh, to our uh, hearing organs. This way, uh, hearing controls a speech production. If you switch off uh, the hearing control, uh, you will see that it's impossible to, uh, to speak, to produce anything. This is actually a simple experiment that can be conducted very simply. This also accounts, and it's a accounts for and at the same time is supported by the fact that uh, muteness is a secondary uh, uh, defect, let's call it so, to uh, deafness. So since a person cannot uh, hear something, he cannot control uh, the production of, of sounds. So it w the brain would ha not have any feedback on what the organs of articulation are producing when he gives them the right uh, signals, so it's impossible to produce uh, speech sounds and to speak in this way. So this is, there's also a special method of testing a faked, uh, uh, say, hearing loss, deafness, if some workers receive benefits for uh, uh, loss of hearing due to the uh, kind of work they perform. So there's a special test that uh, you um, give them a microphone, and you isolate their hearing from their own voice, so you put, give them headphones, uh, where they hear their own voice, but with a delay of, of a few seconds. And within a sh very short time, it, it can be seen that uh, they not, cannot produce anything. So if there's a real uh, hearing loss, uh, it's impossible to uh, produce sounds uh, after uh, a delay is introduced between uh, what they hear, the, their own voice and their own voice production. And uh, it's also uh, certain that comprehension comes before uh, production. So when we uh, start to learn our, actually acquire our first language or learn our second, third and other languages, uh, we definitely come to understand things in that language before we're able to produce uh, speech in this language. We can certainly uh, hear and understand phrases, dialogues, texts in this language, read and understand uh, language, this target language, before we're actually able to uh, speak it with some uh, level of, some degree of fluency. Now, another statement and observation by Tomatius, the differing uh, qualities of sounds in different languages. So here I'm not speaking about the different uh, phonemes peculiar to individual languages and the uh, differentiating qualities of those phonemes. No, this is a totally different thing. Actually, Tomatius uh, states that his uh, research uh, led him to the conclusion that speakers of different languages are uh, preferentially uh, sensitive 
to different uh, ranges of sound frequencies. I, even, I will show you a table with, where you, you can see this uh, in, in detail immediately. So this means that uh, kind of the hearing of the speakers of individual languages is more focused on special uh, zones in the sound, uh, frequency sound uh, spectrum. So this is what he actually offers in one of his books, Nusuntusne uh, Polyglot. He gives a, uh, gives a table like this showing uh, his uh, research results. So there's the language and the frequency measured in hertz, basically. And you see that according to Tomatis, different languages don't coincide in this respect. So some parts of this frequency uh, range over overlap, others don't. And on the basis of this fact, of, of this observation by his, he says that uh, speakers of other languages need special training for their, for their ears. For, uh, they need to prepare their ears for the perception of the sounds of a foreign language in order to uh, well, be comfortable with this and to process speech in that, la in that language uh, naturally without, uh, without discomfort. Now this is an arguable point. I'll give you some uh, other um, well, sort of counter evidence perhaps, or evidence at the same time to this point uh, in, in a few uh, minutes. Also, in the context of this uh, observation, uh, he uh, observes the so-called Slavs' gift of languages. So it says it's, it's, uh, pra the practice shows that people from uh, Slavic countries, people who are native speakers of uh, Slavic languages, seem to have uh, an advantage in learning foreign languages. So somehow they make a lot of progress and they can uh, master for several foreign languages, especially in the uh, oral aspects uh, of them, in terms of producing speech, uh, avoiding accents in, in the foreign languages. So he, he observes that Slavic people uh, seem to have some sort of advantage here. So in thinking about this, he uh, makes the guess that this may be connected to this, uh, to this point. So look at this uh, table. So he only gives uh, his data for Russian as a Slavic language. Since he, has, he says that uh, Slavic languages, so Russian here in this case, has the, the largest, the broadest uh, range of uh, the sound frequencies that its speakers are sensitive to, while others have kind of missing, missing zones and so on. He also observes the fact that uh, it, it is mostly Slavic linguists who develop the uh, discipline of phonology. Now, phonology being the study of the psychological uh, aspect of sounds, the sounds which are present in our mind, that our mind perceives as relevant to the language. There are a few dozen of them in each language, from 20 to about 80, so 30, 40, 50 on average. So, Trubiskoy, uh, uh, Kurtene, uh, the uh, Prague linguistic circle, so Russian, uh, Polish, uh, Czech uh, linguists are actually the ones who laid the foundations of phonology. So whether it's a coincidence or not, uh, Tomatis's opinion here is that this, this, this is not coincidental, that this is thanks to the fact that there is, uh, there is as uh, those of people, native speakers of Slavic languages, are more sensitive to different distinctions in the sounds that human ear can, uh, can perceive. Now, the data from other sources. So I think this is the most debatable uh, of Tomatis' statements about uh, language and hearing, but still there is some evidence uh, I've uh, gathered from, from other sources. So there is an observation experimentally demonstrated, and you'll see a reference at the end if you're interested. Uh, actually, the study was conducted 40 years ago in 1975, but it has recently been reprinted in a book by uh, Tatiana Chernigovska in Russia, uh, which demonstrated that uh, human hearing is selectively sensitive to uh, frequencies of speech uh, sounds. So our ears, although they can perceive a big, uh, wide range of, uh, of frequencies, uh, approximately from 20 to 20,000, Heads, but our hearing seems to focus to be kind of more alert uh, to the sounds within a certain uh, frequency range, namely from about 2,000 to 4,000 or to 5,000 hertz. This is the preferential zone of human 
hearing. And so the authors who write about this, they connect it with this evolutionary mechanism or strategy to uh, give preference uh, to the signals that have vital significance to, uh, to the organism. So since speech is so important to us, uh, human race would be non-existent uh, in, in the way we understand it as a human, human species wouldn't be uh, human species without a speech. So there's even an expression that speech is special. So it's special to the species of, of uh, Homo sapiens um, and well other possibly other uh, close relatives to our, spe to our species. So there is evidence that our hearing, although capable of distinguishing sounds, of perceiving sounds of a wider range, they, that they are uh, more focused on the frequencies that characterize human speech. Also, uh, there seem to be indications that different languages, on a more practical, empirical level, that uh, different languages are pronounced with different pitch. So basically that some languages, they tend to sound, in the speech of their, of their native speakers, uh, tend to sound lower and others tend to sound higher. Then, com as compared to our mother tongue, so when we start learning a foreign language, we can observe that this particular language seems to sound louder in general or higher in terms of tone, in terms of pitch, than our mother tongue. So there seem to be observations, there, se there seems to be uh, evidence of this sort too. Although I put a question mark here because I cannot give you 100% uh, guarantee on this. I've only seen some online publications. I haven't uh, seen printed academic uh, references uh, about this, but it, it seems to uh, to have something in this. I think it, it, it may be confirmed later on experimentally. Now, and the final uh, point I'd like to uh, to mention. Uh, from Tomatis' uh, ideas about hearing and language. So concerning musical stimulation, the role of music. So music is different from, from speech, obviously, even uh, neurologically, uh, on, on the level of our brain, it's, it seems to be analyzed and perceived uh, differently than uh, the sounds of speech. So the sounds that bring, that carry certain meaning, that have uh, meaning encoded in them. Uh, now, Tomatis uh, says that uh, music uh, played at diff differing frequencies, so music con containing differing frequencies. So first you hear lower frequencies, uh, later on in, this, in the same piece of music there's higher frequencies and there's a change. So they, they kind of, uh, this change is repeated, there's lower and higher frequencies uh, replacing each other in, in the course of the performance of the musical uh, piece. That this is good for the training of our ears, that this can make our ears more uh, sensitive uh, to the perception, to better perception of, of speech and other uh, uh, sonic, uh, phonic stimuli from outside. On the basis of this, he developed a device called the electronic ear, so which is kind of a special device with headphones that you put on, and there are different kinds of sounds uh, played there, including classical music, uh, Gregorian chant, and other forms of sound stimulation with different frequencies, especially uh, con containing high frequencies. And if uh, this is uh, uh, used uh, in a repeated manner over some time. This seems to show positive results, for example, in the treatment of stuttering and other problems with speech, with hearing, and so on. Uh, one of, probably the most famous example is Gérard Depardieu, the French actor, who was Tomatius's patient. He addressed him in the early stages of his career to, to, heal, to treat his stuttering. And you can watch videos online with uh, Depardieu where he actually uh, pays uh, tribute to Tomatius, saying that this is really so. He went to see Tomatius twice a week or so, and he would listen to uh, well, Mozart's music uh, in the headphones of the electronic ear in his, in his laboratory, and this actually helped him get rid of the stuttering problems and so on. Now, broadening this, uh, he formulated what he called the Mozart effect, and Tomatius was actually the person who uh, invented the term Mozart, uh, Mozart effect. It later became used in a, in a broader sense, and it was even compromised, I think, by more kind of commercialized and popularized uh, use of this word. And Tomatius meant a different thing. 
with it. So he meant that um, classical music, especially music of the Baroque period, of the classical period, and uh, Tomatis, uh, uh, sorry, and Mozart in the first place, has a tonifying and sensitizing, sensi sensitizing effect on, on hearing. So it can make uh, hear our ears more sensitive to the perception of the missing frequencies of the, if, if we have, if there is, uh, if there's a problem with the, the ears failing to distinguish certain uh, frequencies in the in the sound range and so on, and also more broadly that this uh, stimulation can also help in uh, tre treating problems of related functions, of functions related to uh, to speech, so some other therapeutical and educational uh, applications. But this only operates if if this is. Uh, performed in a continued uh, manner over sufficient time. So listening to Moses for five minutes does not uh, change uh, much. So this is, was one of the claims that were made later in the more kind of commercialized uh, use of the term the Mozart effect, that listening to Mozart for 15 minutes makes you smarter and so on. So this is not what uh, Tomatis meant. So he meant in the first place that this kind of music has uh, a very positive effect on the uh, so, on the biological level, on the functioning of our ears. And also, just one practical uh, point here, headphones are definitely better than, than loudspeakers. So the stimulation is much more, significantly more effective if you listen to this music uh, in, in the headphones, because then the, your brain and auditory organs, they get this uh, musical stimulation in a more straightforward way. So if you listen to it in, in a room from a loudspeaker, it's uh, much less uh, effective. And so what data from other sources we have about this, about musical st stimulation? Well, in the first place, we have evidence from Suggestopedia, which is a method uh, developed on the basis of suggestology, so a branch of psychology about psychological suggestion. So this suggestion, kind of persuading the person of something, a suggestion. Uh, Georgi Lozanov, a Bulgarian psychologist, doctor, was famous for developing this field of research back in the 60s. And several methods were later developed on the basis of this called intense uh, language uh, training and so on, other individual methods. Uh, there is evidence, experimental, uh, it's been experimentally demonstrated that musical stimulation, either pl when you hear the music played as, as a background, so there's say a tape or the voice of the teacher uh, reading aloud phrases or words or texts in, in, the, in, the, in, in the target language, and there is pl uh, say classical music playing at the background, this actually uh, increases the retention, memorization, better rem memorization of, of these words, these phrases, these texts. It's been experimentally demonstrated. This is actually quite well known in, in the field of uh, well, methodology of language teaching. Suggestopedia is one of the methods. Uh, also, another uh, piece of evidence I'd like to share with you, a recent one, uh, is from a recently published article by Spivak and, and other, several other researchers. Uh, that traditional, uh, this is the terms they use in their research paper, so traditional versus non-traditional music, and this is subjective. So the traditional is whatever the, uh, the person perceives as traditional for him within his uh, kind of view, uh, view of the world. So if uh, the person perceives this kind of music as traditional and is exposed to this, this uh, seems to lead to a reduction of uh, stress and a rise of life expectancy. It's been even tested experimentally on the uh, biological uh, molecular level. It's actually quite a technical article. You will see a reference uh, in two minutes. So if you're interested, you can see it. It's actually me measure, measuring the effects of this musical stimulation on the level of cells. But this is uh, a purely scientific uh, piece of research, recently published. So this definitely shows that mu uh, music, traditional music, well, say classical music uh, perhaps, has a positive effect on, on hearing at least, and it can lead to a broader, broader effects in, in the long-term perspective. 
Now, conclusions. So, Tomatissa's ideas, uh, the ones that I mentioned, not all of them, he published 14 books, uh, and other aspects of his uh, therapeutical approaches, they apply to treating autism and psychological disorders and, and other things. So, these fields, I'm no expert in them, so I cannot comment on this. And they seem to be more debatable, but in terms of language, what he said about hearing and language, it seems to be consistent with the uh, information from other sources, so some of which I have mentioned now. Uh, the, the most unclear point to me so far is the one of the uh, different uh, frequency zones of different languages. So Tomatis was definitely a good researcher and a medical doctor, so he must have had grounds for uh, providing us with that information, that a graph that, that you saw, with different, measuring different um, pre preferential uh, frequency zones for different languages. But I have to say that I don't really understand the methodology by which he obtained uh, his data. So at least for me, it needs, I, I need some clarification, I need some explanation here to understand better what he meant. And also, this brings us to the next point, uh, Tomatis's ideas and observations, they need accurate interpretation. So in, to interpret them, to comment them, to say, well, this is wrong or this is right, uh, even before to trying to test it experimentally, we need to uh, be sure that we understand what Tomatis uh, meant uh, with this. So, and I'm not completely sure what he means with those different frequencies for different languages. Yes, yeah, so I, I came across this point. He mentioned it in several of his books. Uh, but it's not completely uh, certain what exactly he means. Does he mean that we're unable to hear other frequencies? This would be false, because any human ear is biologically capable of, li of hearing sounds within the range I mentioned, from about 16 to 20,000 uh, hertz. So we are capable of listening to, of hearing all the other sounds still within this uh, range. So if he says that well, a certain, uh, certain language focuses on the range of the uh, on the zone from 2,000 to 4,000 hertz or something like this. Uh, so does he mean we cannot hear the other sounds? This would be wrong. So probably he doesn't mean that. But what does he mean in this case? Does he mean that we are kind of better equipped or we, are, we feel more comfortable automatically, habitually perceiving speech sounds in, within that zone, and that when, when we're exposed to speech sounds which are in a different zone of, fre uh, of frequencies, we feel and more uncomfortable, or we feel difficulty in processing that uh, information fast with our brain. So this is not completely uh, clear to me yet. So there's a lot of uh, room for further experimentation and research in all these issues related to audio linguistics, to what I called audio linguistics, the study of the connection between hearing, uh, speech production, understanding spoken language, uh, musical stimulation, uh, brain functions. There's a lot of uh, research that can be done there. So this, is a, this will be a very fertile soil for, uh, for, for researchers. And it all seems to me quite uh, relevant to, to learning languages in particular. So these are the practical implications I make from the previous theoretical information that quality listening uh, is a major source of uh, language learning, so actually audio input seems to be the primary source of language learning because in, in, in all human beings, except for uh, people with hearing loss who use signed uh, languages, so language is oral speech, it's spoken speech. Uh, spoken language has existed as a human species for about 200,000 years, while the, the oldest writing systems about, are about 5,000 years from now. So you see that most of the human history uh, language existed only in the oral form. So when we are born, when we biologically perceive and acquire the language, it is through uh, oral speech. It is in the form of oral speech. Writing, then, uh, the language skills related to, uh, to writing and reading are secondary to this. So our brain processes this in the first place as sound information. Uh, this also means that listening uh, has priority as as a language skill before others, before speaking, reading, and writing. So uh, we would be uh, following a much more nature-compatible way if we uh, train ourselves or if we provide ourselves with enough listening input in the target language before we force ourselves to, 
to use it to produce some output or before we start uh, training ourselves in the written aspects of this language. Also, a, a very practical point which can be drawn from the uh, sad observations is that pronunciation depends on hearing capacity. So actually, uh, our ability to have good pronunciation in a different language other than uh, our native one, in a, in a foreign language that we consciously learned, depends directly on the uh, clarity of the distinctions we can make between the sounds when we hear them in that uh, target language. If we, can, if we do not hear, clearly this, the distinction between those sounds, we will not be able to reproduce them. This is because of the auditory control over speech production I mentioned earlier, because just brain works this way. To produce something, he should be able, he, it rather, should be able to, to control it. So it's, it's quite, it seems quite obvious uh, though. So in the context of this, I wonder if we can say that perhaps uh, we have certain auditory setting uh, in our native language, which then has uh, interfering influence on uh, the languages we'll, we'll try to learn afterwards. So uh, the concept of a ticketary setting is quite well established in, in foreign language phonetics. So the kind of the combination of uh, positions of uh, articulatory organs and the kind of automated uh, uh, reflexes, how we, we use them to start speak immediately in a certain language. So which uh, muscles work harder and which are uh, less used in this process. So this is quite, quite well known. I wonder if we can say that there's a similar thing for uh, audition, for listening, that there's a certain auditory uh, setting. So the way that we are kind of naturally prepared or automatically prepared for listening sound, speech sounds, speech sounds, not music, speech sounds in a certain way, so in, in certain aspects, uh, in certain uh, ranges of frequency, among other things, for example. So this remains a question, but I think it's not uh, uh, without ground. And finally, the use of music can definitely enhance the effect. So music, of course, cannot learn, teach you the language completely. Nothing can replace fully featured language learning materials. As one polyglot uh, mentioned in his uh, memoirs in one of his books, I think it's uh, Janic in Speak Like a Native, he says that learning a language largely depends on uh, it's largely about quality time spent working with quality materials. So we, we need quality input and audio input, it seems, in the first place to begin with. Of course, uh, written uh, aspects of the language can come later. And we need good, fully featured, fully developed learning materials with a lot of uh, inputs for us to digest. Reading, samples of the language, audio listening courses, video courses, uh, etc. But music can intensify uh, this effect. So these are some of the sources I have uh, used so where you can get more information on this topic if you're interested. Uh, and uh, these are the uh, particular references to the articles I mentioned concerning uh, different frequencies and human ears being aimed at the frequencies of human speech and the influence of musical traditional music, stimulation by traditional music on uh, life expectancy and uh, stress level. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm particularly interested in language acquisition and children. I teach children languages and as a mum I taught my own children languages. Um, I've heard a lot said about like a window of uh, like a time window of acquisition from like six months to six years is the best point and the sooner you hear and introduce to other languages the better is that do you feel that's in keeping with what you've said or does it sound totally different so this is the question of the so-called critical period for language acquisition so both about first language acquisition and second language acquisition now concerning first language acquisition this is certain this is definitely so if a child is not is not exposed to human speech to any human language uh, before the age of about five, or before the age of puberty in, in the long, kind of, in the broader perspective, and preferably before the age of five, uh, he or she will not be able to acquire any human language afterwards. Because just the, the physiology and the chemistry of our organism and our, of our brain changes later, and a, a acquisition of, of a language system will not be possible afterwards. So this is the case of the so-called uh, children of the jungle and so on. So there are several dozen cases of 
this in history, when a person we found who, were, who was raised like uh, Mowgli by uh, animals in, in, the, in the jungle, in the forest, and there are real cases like this. These people cannot be uh, taught human language afterwards. They, of course, they are humans. They, they can uh, use simple logic. They can partly integrate into human society, but they cannot learn to, to speak or to, to understand human speech completely in, in very uh, limited uh, doses. So there is definitely this window for first language acquisition before the age of five is the preferential zone, definitely. Maybe in some cases, so till the age of puberty, I, I, may, I can imagine that maybe in some exceptional cases, so uh, an older child uh, so may uh, acquire parts of the language system if he's exposed to human speech afterwards at the age of, I don't know, 10, although this is debatable. I don't know if there are any cases, real cases of this uh, in, in history, but this window definitely exists, this is certain doesn't exist for second language acquisition, just to uh, clarify this point. This only works for first language acquisition. Second languages can be learned, so intentionally learned at any age. Hi, I have another, another question uh, here. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, towards the end, you talked about listening as a form to learn languages. And based on your studies, you also talked about the dis different frequencies of languages. So I was wondering if um, it's more useful to actually be exposed to the full range of frequencies of a new language, or if it's more about getting exposed more frequently to the basic sounds of the new language that you're acquiring. What is more beneficial? Uh, so the only thing you can practically do is to either use recordings of your target language, which would then automatically contain the right frequencies for this language, right? If this frequency question is, uh, if this issue is, is valid, if, if this is true. Uh, in the first place, we're speaking about high frequencies. So human, human speech is largely about higher frequencies. So this normal range is from two to four to 5,000 Hertz, but it seems, at least according to Tomatis, that other speakers of certain languages, they also have good ears for higher uh, frequencies. And if, you, if this is true, and if you learn this language, uh, then it would mean that uh, you may be kind of lacking uh, training with your ears uh, within that higher frequency range. So what you can do, uh, just uh, practically, is either to listen to the recordings of that language simply, just to uh, give your, your ears uh, a chance to, uh, to get used to the perception of these sounds. It seems it's largely, according to Tomatius, it's, it's largely about the uh, functioning, about the work of the muscles of the middle ear. So we have the external, the inner, and the middle ear. So there are muscles attached to the little bones uh, in the middle ear that actually transmit, that actually transmit these physical acoustic signals, which are the waves in, in the air uh, coming into our ears, into uh, signals that are then uh, transported to the brain in the electric form. Uh, you can simply provide yourself this audio input, although the other option, a more kind of t technological option, is to use something like Tomatis' electronic ear, which is to use a specially recorded set of uh, well, uh, sounds, so musical stimulation uh, piece, which would contain, I don't know, maybe classical music or su a speech in certain languages, or just non-musical combinations of different sounds, which seems to be the case with, uh, with the electronic ear. And just uh, allow yourself to, uh, to hear it for, uh, for, some, for sufficient time w uh, in repeated sessions. At least, at least according to Tomatis' uh, statements and some experimental evidence, this uh, should have a positive effect. Thank you very much, Grigory Kazakov.